What are the most common mistakes that startup entrepreneurs make nowadays? Startup can go down a road of not talking to users for a long time and sort of they get the skew against what the market actually wants and what they're building. The most important thing you can do as a startup in, in the re upcoming recession is not die. What's up, YouTube? I'm your host, Giovanni, and today we are talking about investments in crypto startups with Brett Gibson, partner at Initialized Capital. How are you today, Brett? I'm great, great. Happy to be here. Thanks a lot, Javon. So for those who don't know, Initialized Capital is an early stage venture capital firm with over 500 million under management and several unicorns in its portfolio, such as Coinbase and Instacart. How did you arrive at Initialized Capital and uh, what is your role there? Yeah, so I'm a, I'm a partner in Initialized. I was uh... I, I spent most of my career writing software and founding a few software startups. And, and one of the companies I founded was a company called Posturus, it's a blog platform uh, we founded in 2008. And one of my co-founders there was Gary Tan, who, who founded Initialized Capital. So I worked on and off with him throughout the years. And uh, he, you know, I was looking for a job in 2017 and decided to join Initialized. And uh, as a partner, I both I invest in startups and I and I help work with the portfolio and advise the companies we invest in. Mm -hmm. But you have a, a specific focus on software, right? So you are focused on the software side of the companies. Yeah, yeah, definitely, and in, probably more specifically the engineering side. So I'll, I'll you know do general kind of startup advice for companies, but also advise them specifically in engineering. And then and then when I'm investing, you know, if I having a more technical background and. I focus on investments where that's useful, and among those is uh, is the crypto space. Initialized Capital funds company before they get product market fit, which means before they have a product ready to satisfy the needs of the market. What are the main criteria you look at before investing into a project? Yeah, definitely. I think I mean we definitely over-index on the founders themselves, and 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 funding the types of founders who can you know navigate. Um, the what it takes to get to product market fit. So you know, there's they, they're probably the, before you actually know what the product is um, and what market exactly they're going to be serving. You know, the founders are the strongest signal, um, and oftentimes you know you'll see kind of early product iterations and their ability to build product. Um, you know, it helps a lot. And then and then we're also thinking through what if if the fit works out, what the market opportunity looks like and the size of it. You look at the team as one of the most important uh, parts of the, the company you're investing into. So what kind of characteristic does the team need to have in order to inspire your, your confidence? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, we, 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 a lot of us come from software backgrounds. So we, we were definitely attracted to people who are able to build. Um, and so technical founders and, and founder, founders from, who have a history of building and shipping products are, are very attractive. And then, you know, just it's, you know, I think there's a lot of signal when a founder comes in and they kind of know everything about the business. Like they've done sort of deep research into all the aspects of what the market they're looking at and, and who, whose pain point they're addressing and why. Um, and, you know, the deeper their, their thought around that, um, it kind of shows both that they put the time in to figure out what's going on and that, you know, they, they have the kind of uh, analytic structure and ability to, to to hone the product to a place where it's going to resound in the marketplace. What was the most profitable investment that the Initialized Capital ever made? So, I mean, you know, we're a fairly young fund. I mean, so, you know, we, do, we don't have as long a history as some funds, but to, to date, I mean, I think our, our early investment in Coinbase um, has, been, has been the, uh, the biggest return of the fund so far. What's the secret of the success of a company like Coinbase, which became a unicorn? Well, I mean, I don't know. There's a lot going on with Coinbase. I mean, some of it just has to do with their ability to get banking relationships in a time where it was hard for for crypto companies to get banks generally. I think that they're focused kind of on the user experience, and I think that um, you know, I think that we'll, we'll see. You know, as they're you know they're a centralized solution, but a lot of the first generation of of things in the decentralized space are these centralized solutions that have deep hooks to the decentralized world. So. You know, you go on Coinbase and you can, you know, you buy, you could buy Bitcoin with in a centralized experience, but you can move it off whenever you want. So it's still, it's still integrated with the entire decentralized Bitcoin network. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. So if you had to identify right now 
the, a new Coinbase, uh, like a company that you would bet on to become as big as Coinbase, what would that be in the crypto space? I mean, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm so far, I'm a fairly large believer in Vice and Trails and what they're doing and, and, the, and the, the, the size they can reach, especially if the staking networks, um, you know, take up as much of the eventual crypto market as we think. So I think there's, there's kind of tremendous scale and the, and the ability to, to run, to run the infrastructure on networks that are powering money around the world. So I'm curious to know what percentage of the company's equity do you get in return after funding it? It's, um, it's, you know, it's been, it's changed over the years. We've had a few different funds of different sizes, um, you know, in our most, in our most recent $225 million fund that is again, due to most of the seed deals, we have to target about 15% ownership at, after the seed round, um, you know, for the, to make the economics of the fund that size work. A couple of years ago, during the ICO boom, crypto startups were raising capital very quickly, taking advantage of the hype surrounding cryptocurrency. As we know, most of those ICO were money grabs or just useless products. Did you notice any improvement in terms of quality in projects in the crypto space since then? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's not to say that there weren't quality projects um, during the boom, but it, you know, there was just a lot of noise and a lot of other, other sort of ICOs related projects being raised. But you know, since the fraud has come out of the market, you know, we've seen the people who are here to build for the long term and who are deeply sort of engaged in the space continue to build. So there's been a lot of impressive work since, um, I think. And I think, you know, I, I think, you know, in a lot of, um, you know, a lot of the, a lot of very strong companies come out of downturns generally. You know, if you think of things that happened right after the dot com crash or right after the, uh, the mortgage crisis, um, you know, very strong companies were built because you get, you get kind of steel, you know, founders who, who are, who are really more mission driven and, and, and willing to stick it out. And I think, I think the same is going to be true of what happened after the ICO, the ICO crash and the, and the crypto stuff, the companies that were started, you know, I mean, late 2018, 2019. After the ICO boom, we saw other ways for crypto startups to raise funds, such as IEOs and STOs. So would you say that venture capital funding is the best way for crypto startups to raise money nowadays? I, I think it's a good question. And I, I, think, I think it's actually quite complex. I, I mean, I think generally, you know, not all startups or not all, you know, newly built software businesses need VC funding, right? Because it's, um, it's, it's specific to a type of market and a type of high growth company that, that not all, that not all companies should be, should be shooting for. Um, and then, you know, it's, it's compounded by the fact that in crypto, you have this, you have, you know, well, token issuance, which is, which is entirely different from kind of selling equity and, and what it means. And I think that, um, uh, right now there's even this regulatory moment, you know, we're seeing with this, with a ton sale, like, what does it even mean if you're selling your tokens early on to venture investors? Is that, is that something that's going to be sustainable or workable? Um, I think there are plenty of companies in the crypto space where venture funding still makes sense. I think that venture firms can be quite helpful. And I think that if you're, you know, you're, you're investing, you're selling equity in your company and it, you know, looks kind of independent of what sector it's in, you know, venture can still be quite helpful. But at the same time, I think if you're, you know, you're trying to get a new crypto network off the ground, um, and, you know, venture investors may not look ideal to regulators and, um, you know, new sources of sort of crowd funding and, and distribution are probably are probably quite interesting and worth considering. Like, I think I mean, I think the token projects like in, in new kind of layer ones, it's not it's not it's not clear to me it's an ideal fit for, for venture firms or, and, and for from the project standpoint, I think that because I think that um, Maybe maybe narrowly defined to the to if you're trying to if you're trying to sell a utility token, and the goal is that to get regulators to eventually accept it as such, um, you know, selling a bunch to investors up front, and 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 venture investors, you know, probably um, is not the ideal. So in that case, what uh, what is the best way to go? Uh, I mean, you know, I, I don't know. There's different camps. Obviously, there's, you know, the ideal would be something if something like Bitcoin were still possible, right? If you if you could do a fair launch, um, 
I think we saw an attempt at that with with Grin, um, and and it unfortunately kind of ended up in a lot of investor hands, anyways. But at, at least from a regulatory profile, it looked right. Um, I think that you know, there, I think that some of these new interesting dual token models make a lot of sense, where you're kind of, you know, you have one token that that is always a utility and not sold to investors, and a secondary token that, that works in the system as an investment vehicle and can be sort of narrowly scoped regulatorily. What are the most common obstacles that startups face nowadays and what can your company do in order to help them out? You know, I think that one of the, the biggest things is, um, you know, you get people who are very talented at building things and then just getting anyone to care, right? Getting the world to want your product and, um, you know, know about it are, 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 so are, are, the hard, are often the hard part, independent of how good a product you can actually build. Um, so I think that, you know, what Initialize Help tries to help do is, you know, work with companies on, um, you know, getting, getting from a, a good product to something that, that resonates in the marketplace, um, both, both sort of strategically and how they think around, you know, who their customers are, who they're trying to address, and then, you know, a little more tactically on like how to actually market and sell. Um, and we can help both, you know, with advice around those topics. And then, you know, we have a decent amount of media reach. So we're also help, able to help promote our companies and get them, you know, get them some attention. What are the most common mistakes that startup entrepreneurs make nowadays? I think that, you know, I think a really common mistake and it kind of relates back to, you know, what the, one of the hardest things is, is, is um, founders will often think that just building a good product is enough and kind of, you know, maybe think like if they build it, that people will just show up and want to use it. And so they don't think through, um, you know, they, they don't always think through exactly how to get their product to market and how to, you know, either make sure they're really addressing a need that people have and people are thinking about or, you know, figure out some sort of loop for how to, how to grow the product and, and grow the user base. Um, so, and I think that um, they, uh, we, what's often hard about that is that it, it, it you know, it takes iteration and it takes kind of, you know, uh, you'll see founders kind of think that they've hit a dead end and, and that's, that's almost never the case. You know, there's always more they can do and try to figure out how to get their product to resonate and what, and what to change about it or, or who else to target. Are you talking about build, the importance of building a community around your product as well? Yeah, I mean, building, I mean, for certain types of product, building community is absolutely essential. I mean, I think, but, other, you know, otherwise I think... Um, just not building something. Sometimes people build things that, that are, that they find are, are they built some, they build things in a vacuum, right? You know, a, a, a startup can go down a road of not talking to users for a long time and sort of, they get the skew against what the market actually wants and what they're building. So really, really engaging with people and validating your assumptions around why people need what you're building um, is, is very important. As a venture capital firm, you have the responsibility to determine what companies will have access to capital. So in a way, you are partly responsible for the growth of the whole ecosystem. What kind of blockchain products and use cases are you betting on to succeed and bring crypto into the mainstream? Yeah, I think, you know, I think right now, I think we're, you know, there's obviously like an infrastructure rollout phase. And so, um, you know, we're betting on companies that are, that are building sort of the building blocks for, for, um, running and, and, and doing these networks at scale. I know an example, again, would be someone like Bison Trails who's helping build out node infrastructure. And then there, you know, there's related things. I think that a lot of what's going on is still financial. And so both, both you know, being able to bridge the gap to, to standard financial things that, that people understand in standard, standard financial systems. Um, an example there would be something like Coin Tracker, which we backed to do sort of tax tax management and, and portfolio managed for crypto, and so they you know they bridge this gap between the crypto world and and the the, the normal financial world that we all have to live with, like with with taxes. Um, so that's I think what a lot of what we're looking at in the financial world. There's a lot to be done to bring kind of the financial system to to the rest of the world. I think what we're seeing and going on in crypto. Now, and especially in sort of the rise of stable coins and places like Ethereum, is that a lot of the world doesn't have access to the financial primitives that, are, that the, Western, the Western world sort of takes for granted. Um, and, and, you know, a stable base currency that they, that they can hold their money in. 
and be able to transact in. And so I think that a lot of the, a lot of the near term vision for crypto is, is 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 bringing that out into the rest of the world. We are talking about ways in which technology can bridge the gap between the traditional financial system and crypto, right? So creating some kind of uh, uh, pro products which um, are basically doing things that, uh, that the financial system is already doing, but better, faster, um, more decentralized way. So, uh, let, for example, it comes to my mind crypto lending, right? There are a lot of platforms that nowadays offer lending services uh, using cryptocurrency. I can mention uh, BlockFi, I can mention uh, Celsius. And then we have uh, decentralized platforms like MakerDAO, which are basically offering same services, but in a fully or almost fully decentralized way. Would you invest in something like BlockFi or something like MakerDAO? I think that both are interesting and I think that both kind of have their space. And in fact, we are investors in a, in a project called in a company called Atomic Loans that does decentralized uh, uh, Bitcoin collateralized loans. The, the difference being that they're not, you know, they're not based on, they use Ethereum stable coins, but they're not based entirely on Ethereum. They, they're based on Bit, the Bitcoin script. So it's kind of DeFi that's closer to the, to the Bitcoin community. Um, I, uh, I, I believe that both, that neither will go away entirely and that the decentralized versions will grow. I think that um, there are, you know, still it's kind of, it's, it's back maybe to the file storage example where um, there, there are values that people care about in, in the sort of transparency and the, um, you know, the, of the of the decentralized solutions, the transparency and sort of lack of ownership, and and sometimes even sensibility of the, of the decentralized solutions, um, and you're trading them off for convenience of the centralized solutions, and so over time, um, you know, I I don't think that all the business is going to go one side or the other. I think that there are plenty of people for whom the the values of the decentralized versions provide are are worth dealing with the the user experience downside and, and then i think the user experience will get better over time so that 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 blend will probably move more towards decentralized systems as we as we move forward but that's not again it's not to say the centralized ones will entirely go away how is the covid19 pandemic changing the way you look at companies and what are the characteristics a startup should have in order to succeed in the upcoming economic recession we're more concerned with the recession, I would say, than specifically than the pandemic. I think obviously there are some companies or portfolio that are doing better. Um, you know, th things like in e-commerce that are doing better because of, because of everyone's at home, and there's some that are doing worse. Um, but I think the the main thing that we've been talking to our portfolio about and thinking about is just runway. Um, I think you know the the most important you know. The most important thing you can do as a startup in, in the re upcoming recession is not die, right? So, you know, you can't, you, can't change, you can't build any sort of business if you run out of money and you're not able to get more. And we think the funding environment is going to get a little bit more adversarial for, for entrepreneurs, especially if there's a bigger macro uh, drawdown. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're advising companies to have more runway, to think more about keeping lean, um, you know, spending less. If they can get to profitability, think about it more now instead of instead of spending, instead of burning, um, burning capital. So that's the our main advice is just you know, lengthen your runway. Awesome! Thanks for being with us, Brett. Thank you. This was great. If you like the interview, hit the subscribe button and subscribe to our channel. See you later. Coin Telegraph, like, subscribe, and hodl.